I'm Niharika Bhutta and I'll be moderating today's session. I request the audience to keep the cameras on to make the uh, session, you know, more interactive. So let's welcome our guest today. Hi, Mr. Visan Pule. It's a pleasure connecting with you virtually. So before we start the session, I would like to, you know, give a small introduction about you. So Mr. Visan Pule is, the, uh, is a computational design director of innovation at Nike, United States. With over nine years of experience at Nike, he also founded companies like Mini Gorele and Jadu. With the vast skill set, he specializes in product design, industrial design, design strategy, concept development, product innovation, fashion, footwear, and many more. An enthusiastic orator, he's also the winner of the first prize in 2008 Design Awards and Gold Prize in 2008. Today, he will be introducing us to this journey in design slash engineering, or as we call designering, as well as co-creation with machines to design performance products based on data. We're very glad to have you, Mr. Pole. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, first of all, like I'm really excited to be here tonight and to share a little bit uh, about my journey, you know, uh, as a designer and engineer. Um, and also talking a little bit about what we're doing uh, with my team at Nike. So I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh, let me know if you can see this. Yeah, we're good? Yes, sir. Good to go. Cool. So, uh, you know, uh, if I go back uh, in time on a thing about the three bucket that really defined me over the years, uh, there is something about being an innovator. Uh, so I work at Nike for the last 10 years and, uh, you know, as an innovator, really like fuel the, the product uh, creation uh, with, with a lot of uh, groundbreaking work. Uh, I've started a synthesizer company, as you mentioned. Um, in the last six years of my career, I've been acting more as a leader. So building team on hiring people uh, to kind of find the best talent in class and bring them uh, to Nike. Uh, I've done quite a few conferences uh, throughout the world uh, on a subject similar to uh, the one I will talk about today. And then the last bucket that I think is uh, very interesting for all of you today is my journey as a student. Uh, and what I mean by student is I don't see me as stopping school and then becoming a professional. I feel like uh, I'm a lifelong learner. You know, I constantly take class online. I try to like learn new skill, uh, get get close to to people like all of you, so I can uh, see a little bit uh, how different people think, how different people uh, work, and get inspired by that. And I also uh, I'm a musician uh, since four years old. Both of my parents are musicians, so that is something that has music has been very important to me. And you will see that it keep coming back uh, through project. So this is a little bit how I talk about uh, my part, my journey. And this is inspired by uh, Nori Oxman. She's a teacher at MIT. And she kind of uh, created that uh, cycle of creativity. And I think it's very relevant when you contacted me and told me that uh, the school was focusing on design and engineering in parallel. I thought that was very interesting because that's kind of has been my approach uh, to design. So I was uh, first trained as a musician. Like I say, you know, I've played the cello since I'm five years old. Um, music is really about uh, art, perception, and culture, sensation. There is some science because, you know, it's based on uh, mathematics and physics, uh, but it's mainly in the spectrum of art. I then had a bachelor in science and studied computer uh, science uh, in engineering uh, school. So that was really deep into that sort of uh, knowledge bucket, science and engineering. I was very much focused on that. And I kind of almost uh, started to leave my artistic practice, which kind of uh, I felt uh, wrong about it, you know? So that's what kind of pushed me back then to study industrial design after engineering and go back into more that bucket of production and utility, as you can see, uh, as 
when we are an industrial designer, uh, we're mainly designing for something that is, is useful to, to people and people life and we're in that sort of production. But as you can see, what's interesting now that I reflect after uh, 15 years of professional career, um, they're really starting to intersect in a very interesting way. And if you think about uh, a lot of uh, the modern world on the technology that uh, we have available as creative and thinker, uh, they're often at the intersection of uh, science, design, art, and, and culture. You know, you see a lot of amazing people out there doing beautiful, for example, data visualization. They are data that uh, are not that, that nice uh, to look at. They are just Excel sheets, but the way people are capable of displaying them and make them meaningful is beautiful and become uh, a piece of art. So those are just some sample of projects, some of my favorite one. On the left, a synthesizer that I designed for a friend of mine. On the right, uh, it was purely a concept, uh, 2007, uh, I designed a, a watch for uh, Nixon uh, with the pong game on it. And that went at the time viral on a lot of uh, what was the early beginning of social networks such as BNs on CoreFlow. And uh, that was kind of a fun project. Uh, this is uh, one of the most uh, kind of groundbreaking project I had a chance to work on at Nike with a phenomenal team, which was the breaking two. Uh, this was a shoe that we designed for Elliot Kipchoge to break the two hours marathon barrier, which is kind of that mythic uh, barrier. But what's more interesting is that groundbreaking innovation then led uh, to create an entire new franchise for Nike running with, uh, as you may have seen in the store, multiple different uh, products that have been kind of almost like generated, mutated from that original invention. And that's what I put on the right, which is the United States patent, you know, as innovator. Uh, and that's true for every big company, you know, you spend a lot of time uh, inventing things and uh, patenting them. Uh, those are really the core of uh, innovation work is to, to, to also create new invention that then become intellectual property for the company. Uh, this is a second project, but we're going to dive deeper in that. Uh, that was the beginning uh, of us at Nike using algorithm on a machine for co-creation. This is a spike for 100 meter that was entirely generated by uh, an algorithm. Uh, I will talk much more in depth about that. And um, uh, lastly, some fun work uh, around synthesizer. Uh, I told you that music was very important to me. So uh, throughout my career, I've mixed music everywhere. Like it can be building synthesizer and starting a company, or it can be playing cello for a yoga class. You know, it's really uh, something that is important to me because music uh, encompasses a lot of the, the practice that I like. There is something about sense. There is something about science, mathematics, physics of uh, all the vibration. Um, it's an experience that you're having with an instrument, uh, you know, uh, that in exchange uh, provide you with a lot of uh, pleasure and um, sensation. And I don't know if you have the sound or not, but uh, maybe not bad <laughs> for that to put the sound on. But this is just a video to show some of the module that I've built. And that module was really unique. You see it here playing the game of Pong. Um, um, what my research was based around here was using a uh, game strategy. So gamification as a way to be able to compose on a synthesizer. So using graphics and game strategy to create a unique relation because between the instrument and the, the creator. So that, that idea of co-creation, you know, like how can you create a meaningful relation with a machine? Uh, this is a fun project that I want to spend a little bit of time to talk about because it's been kind of an obsession uh, lately. And I'm a big fan of James Bond. Uh, what you're looking at here is a photorealistic rendering made with Maxwell. But uh, what's more interesting is the process, you know. So you talk a lot about uh, at the school about design and engineering. So the way I go about that is I take a screenshot from a movie. So in that case, it's Thunderball uh, movie uh, from James Bond. Um, with uh, Sean Connery. 
and I look at the object, and from there I try to like reach reverse engineer what that object is. So because there is some ends, I can kind of have a sense of the size of that object, and I can kind of start to define what are the objects uh, that create uh, this thing. So then I, I go into a 3D software uh, that you may all be familiar with, and I build, uh, you know, that model uh, from scratch, uh, scale one. And what's interesting with that is that object could seem like it's virtual, but it was made for the movie. So it was a physical artifact made by hand that then was recorded into the movie as a virtual uh, medium. But what I'm doing here is I start by recreating it in the virtual world and then render it. So we're still living uh, inside uh, something that is fully digital, but I can also bring into AR. So I start to kind of like blend that sort of mixed reality of being like, you know, I already have that master 3D model, so I can also express it as an AR model, or I can also, uh, you know, uh, bring it as a real object. And if you look at my camera, you will see that I also 3D printed that object. And now that object that was virtual is brought back into the real world. So if you can start to follow where I'm going with that, is uh, I'm really interested this day about the sort of uh, blur line that exists. Uh, thanks to te technology between physical and virtual, between real and unreal and hyperreal. So those are just some other example of uh, things that I've done through my James Bond project. And there is a website called uh, 007.lizand.ai. So you're welcome to go check it out. Those are all, uh, again, virtual objects, but that you can download for free and print on a 3D printer or place in a... So, you know, uh, that really start to, to think about uh, what are the different uh, things that we do when we design. We can uh, do something that is called combination, combina combinational creativity, and that often involves a new combination of familiar ID, you know, so you take two things that are familiar and you create something new out of them. And that is often in the physical and or in the virtual world. Then there is something a little bit more deep that uh, a, a lot of uh, academy, academia have called uh, bricolage exploratory creativity, which involves the generation of new ID by the exploration of structure concept. So you define some concept and then uh, you research uh, within that. And again, this is physical often on or virtual. What I'm more interested in that is that sort of transformational creativity where there is no longer uh, that idea of physical or virtual, and it really involves the transformation of some dimension of the structure. You know, you're fundamentally changing the structure of how you approach things so that new structure can be generated. And um, what's particular with that is you're really navigating uh, within a hyper real uh, sort of uh, world where physical or digital doesn't really matter. On um, really realistically in 2021, it doesn't matter because if the way you build uh, things on the way you design is uh, hyper real, that same file can be used for any of those things. It can be sent for manufacturing to a CNC machine, for example. It can be sent to a 3D printer. It can be rendered. It can be placed in AR. It can be placed in VR. It really doesn't matter anymore. So I wanna just finish on the personal side by a fun project uh, you know, that I just, uh, Complete, complete uh, recently. Um, you know, we've all been working from home. It's been a year that I'm stuck at home and that I haven't seen my office. And I live in 800 square feet. So, you know, work from home, problem solving. I need to live, sleep, and work. So that's really uh, what guide my design process uh, within my life. I need to be able to exercise, maybe do some yoga. I want to be able to store some stuff. I want to be able to watch a movie. Uh, I want a meditation space or maybe something that I can recall. Uh, I want to be able to sleep or sleep some friend in the future when we can have friend over. And I also need to be able to work there uh, because I spend eight hours a day on average on Zoom and I need a desk and a quiet space. So this started to make me think about that uh, modular space. And again, you know, I go directly in 3D these days. I often do just a loose sketch by hand and then move into uh, digital because uh, with 3D, I can work scale one, 
I can work with the actual real material, the right thicknesses, and I can start to really like, uh, you know, experiment and discover what uh, my ideas are about. So the space you're looking at here is a modular space uh, that is composed uh, of a platform, then a storage space, and then an electric lift that allowed you to have a, a desk. And, uh, you know, if you look at it at 5 a.m., maybe uh, you start the day on at 6 a.m., uh, it can be used as a yoga studio. Then as you move through the day at 7 a.m., uh, it get back to going to work, you know, so you can transform it into a desk, uh, which is pretty convenient, uh, work. And then throughout the day, you can uh, kind of change uh, where you work. So it allowed you to really have uh, kind of like a more interesting uh, sort of journey than just sitting at the same desk all day long. And then maybe by 2 p.m. you're just doing some uh, arrangement and storing some stuff you don't need anymore in the apartment. And, uh, you know, this is something that that, uh, that that ID allowed you to do. So then maybe, you know, around 4 p.m. you can use it as a way, a place where you can read and have some tea. And then at 7 p.m. a meditation room. Um, at 8 p.m. by just putting a video projector, you can transform it into a home cinema. Obviously, uh, it's big enough to host a queen bed, so you can also sleep there or uh, receive some guests. So I guess this is uh, kind of closing uh, that sort of chapter on some of my personal projects. Um, uh, what I want you to take away from that is uh, I really see myself as a multidisciplinary uh, designer. I really dislike being put in a box as, oh, you're a footwear designer or you're an engineer and you're a designer. And that's what I thought was really interesting by the approach of your school is that sort of, uh, you know, intersectional approach uh, between engineering design, between communication design, industrial design. And I really believe that uh, the talent of the present and the future are people that are capable of uh, thinking and uh, problem solving across different uh, medium and fields. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, Nike and the team that I've built uh, over the last seven years. Uh, so we're called the computational design team and uh, we're a subset of the design studio in innovation. And I will explain uh, what is computational design, but it's pretty much modern design. You know, it's design, industrial design, but using very much radical method that these days are becoming uh, more or less uh, very general. And I will say that are becoming the main design method, which really lie, uh, the foundation is uh, using a computer and using algorithm to augment your practice as a designer. So instead of using computer as just an assist or something that aid you, you know, it's really becoming something that empower you, unleash your creativity and bring to your day-to-day uh, -day, uh, activity a lot of delight and surprise. So our mission uh, for my team is to anticipate and embrace change and evolve capabilities and imagine the future of footwear. So this is one of the projects we designed in 2017 uh, we use algorithm to create that shoe uh, and it was based on a magnetic charge. So that may be something that you can start to read uh, into the design is, uh, you know, almost like when you place little magnet and then you see the metal kind of radiating around. Or if you drop uh, a stone in the water and you see the water kind of echoing is a little bit similar to that as well. Uh, we really span across like a wide spectrum of things from a really conceptual uh, form like this that was done for 2015 Milan uh, Design Week by your team. And this is entirely 3D printed. And obviously, you know, you look at that and you could say, this is crazy. Um, you know, who knows, maybe in five years, that's what you will look like. What's interesting for my team is to embrace uh, with a lot of excitement what the future could be on using those tools to kind of uh, explore it. And then uh, how do we do that? Uh, by redefining performance and movement through relentless innovation and iconic design. Um, this is one of the first projects we did uh, with uh, computational design, Rio Olympic, and I will dive deeper in a minute, but it was uh, to date one of the most beautiful projects that uh, our team got a chance to, to you know, uh, accomplish. 
So now I'm gonna dive a little bit uh, back uh, on a little bit deeper into what computational design is and how we use it. So if we step back in time, you know, 1997, uh, you may or may not uh, remember about IBM. Um, uh, you know, at, at the time IBM was really pioneering artificial intelligence. And in 1997, they set up uh, a game of chess with legendary chess player Gary Gasparov. And what you're seeing here is something that probably could fit in your pocket today. You know, it's a gigantic computer that was literally built, custom built, to play a game of chess uh, with Gary Gasparov. Um, uh, you know, what's interesting with uh, this story is that uh, Gary Gasparov get beat up by Deep Blue. And uh, for a lot of people, as you can see on the right by the face of those people, it's the first time that people are really starting to look at computer, telling themselves like, dang, like a computer can actually beat a human being at one of the most complicated game that uh, we have on earth, you know, like uh, something that people always deemed as, hey, you need to be a mathematician genius to play chess. You need to be very uh, good at like strategy, calculating position in your mind at the light of speed. Uh, the computer beat up Gary Gasparov. Uh, you know, two wins for IBM, one for the champion. This is pivotal uh, in the sense that uh, really like for the mass, again, they started to look at computer in a little bit of a different way than a dumb, dumb machine that is just calculating things, you know. I think what's even more interesting was that story is uh, Gary Gasparov, instead of uh, looking at the computer like a threat or like something that, uh, you know, you have to fear of because the computer can beat you up, he started to, to think that, hey, wait a minute, I want to understand why the computer uh, is, so, is, is capable of beating me up. There's probably something that I can learn from or that I can leverage and partner with. So it's interesting because he came up with that concept uh, called advanced chess, also sometimes uh, referred as cyborg chess or center chess. And um, the objective is the human, uh, the human player playing uh, with a computer chess uh, program, but playing as a team, not playing against each other. So it's like I'm playing with a computer in a tandem against you, and you're also playing with a computer. And uh, what's very interesting with that is that it's been proven to have a few benefits, you know, increase the level of play to act never before seen in chess. He also produced very interesting uh, game with the qualities and the beauties of both perfect tactical play, which is coming from the computer, on highly meaningful strategic plan, which is something that human beings are doing really well. You know, and he also give you the, the viewing audience an insight into the thought process of both a strong human chess player and a strong chess computer on the combination. So, you know, we're talking 1997 and Gary Gasparov are already identified that beautiful idea of, uh, you know, um, teaming up with a computer as opposed to trying to be the rival or seeing computer as, oh my God, I'm going to be replaced by a computer. I'm going to lose my job. Uh, so that's really what I want you to take away uh, today. Okay, algorithms. Uh, I probably don't have to talk too much to you about it because you're the generation that uh, live surrounded by algorithms. But in a nutshell, you know, I think one of the best examples is probably Google. Uh, this is 1997, and it's funny to see that the page has barely changed. <laughs> you know, so uh, they created that very powerful idea that uh, you can have an algorithm that index a web page, rank them, and then give you back a search. And we all know the their story. You know, and uh, what's interesting to note is starting in 97, you could just search web page. But as Google uh, built up uh, in the year, they kept adding more and more intelligent features, you know, like voice, like Google Maps, Google Vision, like Smart Lens, uh, to the point that this day you can take your phone, scan a flower, and Google Lens will tell you what flower it is. You know, pretty amazing. Uh, again, this day we're surrounded of algorithm everywhere. You know, I think I always love the car example because you can actually see what the vision system is doing. Uh, kind of cataloging all those things around it. Oh, that's a human being, that's a dog, that's a road, that's a tree. I'm making decision on the fly for you on what needs to happen, 
on uh, this is very interesting because obviously it's not a dumb system the car is constantly learning uh, new new things you know about the environment so at Nike we have a really interesting story we have uh, Bill Bowerman that it was uh, the one of the co-founder of uh, Nike but uh, most importantly he was a coach and he was coaching students like uh, all of you you know and he was coaching them in track and field on running on what uh, Bill Bowerman as an innovator and um, inventor uh, found is that people have really weird feet, you know, everybody has a different feet. So if you look at your feet, sometimes the left and the right feet are different. If you look at your front feet, they will have a different size, different form. So he quickly understand that trying to put everyone in the same shoe wasn't quite right and wasn't quite correct. So what he will do is he will take shoe and modify them. He will shape them. He will make them bigger uh, and he will measure the athlete, athlete feet and really start to make custom uh, footwear. Obviously at the time it was done uh, with hand tool, you know, and it wasn't scalable. So it was probably just for a handful of uh, athletes that uh, he was coaching. But it's a beautiful idea, you know, and it's at the roots of Nike. And that is why Nike is such an innovative company is some of the people that founded and created Nike were truly trying to innovate uh, for the athlete to make a better product. So our uh, mission statement on, uh, is to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. And as you can see, we have athlete at Asterix. And we say, if you have a body, you're an athlete. So the question I can ask all of you is, how do we design for every athlete in the world? And the answer is that it's really complicated. You know, because as we just saw, everybody has a different body, everybody has different feet. So the level of complexity that comes with designing any sort of product of the family of clothes, something that you wear on your body, or to a certain extent, even I wear, you know, is a complicated paradigm uh, because of the shape of the head that completely transform from one person to the other. Uh, and I always love that diagram that kind of show a lot of uh, athletes uh, they all world-class athletes, and you can also see how the body is different from one athlete to the other because the muscle group are adapting and evolving uh, based on the needs of the sport. So the reality is for all those years, we've designed for average, you know, and uh, that's true for a lot of products, and uh, it's often really bad, you know. Uh, and that's something we say uh, we want to try to get better at it. Uh, we want to go from a batch of one uh, to something that is uh, more, more, more. We want to go to a, from mass production to a batch of one. So in 20, early 2013, 14, we started to work with Shelian Fraser Price. She is the fastest woman uh, on earth to date, uh, amazing uh, sprinter from Jamaica and uh, at the time a uh, Nike athlete. So, you know, one of the things that we do really well in innovation is listening to the voice of the athlete. So, really starting by going outside to the real world and talking to athletes uh, from all level, you know, from uh, entry level all the way to professional athlete on understanding uh, what they mean. The way we do that is uh, we have a, a, a lab called the Sports uh, Research Lab at Nike. And we use a lot of fancy equipment such as motion capture that you see here, uh, force plate, uh, you know, a bunch of high speed camera. And that really allowed us to build those uh, interesting model and to capture data in a way that uh, really is uh, super meaningful for us designer. So we're capable of uh, bringing an athlete in the lab and um, make them do some very specific uh, action that we want to understand. And then uh, we can review uh, that data later and kind of get a very rich set of data from uh, that um, kind of experience. So how do we best leverage the data to inform design? Well, for the last 30 years uh, of design industry, uh, it's been impossible because the tool we were using weren't capable of uh, making sense of that data. So what you see here is very traditional. That's 99.5% uh, of the design industry. Uh, it's called CAD and it's making a file uh, by drawing by hand. So really using the computer uh, as just the same medium as paper, a little bit more advanced and uh, you're capable of like going faster, obviously, on making change. 
but you you can't really make sense uh, of all the data that is coming from the athlete. And this for the longest time uh, has been what we've used, which is computer aided design. So the computer is there to to really assist you. Um, is just doing whatever you're asking uh, the computer to do. And it's mainly used to increase the productivity of the designer. Like there is no idea of trying to inspire the designer or trying to like decouple the potential of the designer. It's, it's really about productivity. So we started to look at computational design that was uh, at the time really starting to emerge <laughs> One of the main uh, kind of uh, design method, mainly used by architects at the time, such as Zadid uh, or you know Roslov Grove, or a, a bunch of those early adopters and pioneers of that field that have used computational design to create very complex models that describe how a building get built. On um, what computational design is, is the application of computational strategy, so pretty much uh, algorithm design to the design process. And what's more interesting to note is that the goal is not to document the final results, but rather all the steps that are required to create that results. And I think that's what's really interesting because if you think about it, when you design in, the, in a more traditional uh, process, you often do a sketch of a chair or you do a coupled sketch. And then after a few iterative steps, you start to refine your design. And by the time you have refined your design, you have one solution on your building that chair and you have your final design. What computational design is trying to do is what are saying like, look, we want to be able to explore an entire design space of chair. I want to see a chair that has two legs, even if it doesn't make sense. I want to see a chair that has three legs, four legs, five legs, six legs, seven legs, eight legs. I want a chair that is capable uh, of holding uh, something really heavy. I want a chair that is really flimsy and fragile. I want a chair that looks like a triangle. I want a chair that looks like a square. So you see where I'm going. We want to be able to really explore a very rich uh, possible of design solution. And the way we're doing that is by documenting all the steps to create the results. So I can build a model that say the, the chair can have X amount of legs. And I keep building my model that way to uh, introduce that idea of parameters, uh, which we're going to talk about more in that. So there is often three uh, very uh, important things to a computational design process. There is a design scheme, a mean of creating variation, and a mean of selecting desirable outcome. And probably uh, the last one is, is the most important when you build a product that are performance product because it's wanting to be able to uh, design and output a lot of concepts. You need to be able to validate those concepts, you know, to make sure that what you're doing uh, meets the requirements and that what you're doing uh, is an answer to the problem uh, you've asked. So, you know, the first step we talk about it, it's data collection. And, and again, you know, we can have a very, very rich data set this day. A very accurate uh, representation uh, of, of what an athlete is doing in space, in the 3D space. And um, that is uh, something that has radically changed the way we can uh, design. So what you're seeing here is Cheyenne Fraser Price running across the track and we can track uh, the pressure she put on the floor uh, as a vector. Uh, we can have all that, all that information back uh, as a model. So the second step is how can we take uh, all that data on translating or design problem into something that we can compute? So we started by looking uh, in the nature and asking ourselves, is there anything that we can learn from nature in how nature has been building stiff on light structure? You know, that's what we want to do for a sprint uh, spike. You want the product to be as light as possible, but you want a product that is stiff. So every time you run, you know, you can propel from that product and not break the plate. So we found that system, uh, it's a Jatoms uh, that do those two things really well, you know, it can travel uh, in the ocean really well because it's light, but at the same time, it can uh, live and uh, have a long life because it doesn't collapse on itself uh, due to its intricate structure. So from there, we can look at this and try to understand how we can recreate that through mathematic, mathematical model and algorithm. So not just looking 
at the design or the aesthetic of it and just make it a graphic, but rather understanding what is the architecture, what is the foundation of uh, that uh, organism and how can we reproduce that mathematically. On, uh, what we're doing is really build, building a tool versus using a tool. We're building our own tool. And there is something uh, very interesting that Doug Engelbart said in 1962, is that a tool doesn't just make something easier. It allows you to, to really like dive into a new previously impossible way of thinking, living, and being. And if you look at what's happening in the world of computational design or generative design, uh, what's radically different with the people that uh, practice in that field is that those people are tool builders. They build their own tool. So very similar to, for example, a Japanese woodworker that will start by building his own uh, you know, woodworking tool, like his own knife to make a very specific uh, design. That's what we're doing. We're not using out of the shelf uh, existing software. We're running our own kind of algorithm that become a tool to generate design. So what that allowed us to do is really creating variation on generating a design solution. So what you see here is a little bit of a sneak peek at what's happening behind the design of a product. We're creating, a, you know, understanding the center of pressure of the product. And for each given uh, little cell, we're understanding what's, what's the mathematical relation between the center of pressure uh, that was defined by the data on the structure. And then we start to build that uh, mathematic model that is live, you know, it's a dynamic model. And that's kind of the paradigm shift uh, between a traditional design process and a generative process is that uh, it's a model that is constantly live. It can have multiple states, you know, if you change the data that is coming and you plug uh, a different data set, the model will update and create a new design. So it's very rich and uh, very exciting to work with because it's not a static uh, 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 kind of a problem space. And that's where we landed uh, for the first iteration of uh, the Rio plate. Uh, exploring design space, you know, and that's a really interesting uh, notion that was computational design. What you're seeing here is a video from Autodesk, a software company based in uh, Silicon Valley. And they're uh, studying a drone chassis, so for um, a flying drone. And again, you know, as you can see here, the model is going through a lot of different variation uh, based on different uh, constraints uh, to the model from light to heavy, from strong to flexible, until the model can find by itself uh, the best solution uh, to the design problem. So that's kind of that idea of searching and curating design space. So at Nike, the way we do it is we use computer simulation. And that's a really fast way to kind of remove a lot of solutions that don't work. So we're here reproducing in the computer a bending motion, which is what's happening with the product in the real world. So we're bending in the computer the model, and we can see in those little red area where the model will potentially fail and crack. So we can remove all the solution on the fly until we move on to the real world testing that is uh, necessary because um, there is something interesting uh, with designing product uh, to be uh, for the for the human uh, for the human body is that uh, you can try to predict the best uh, product with science and mathematics, but then when people put it on, they may simply not like it. And we see that over and over, which is that idea of perception versus perfection. You know, you could say, this is the best shoe for you. The mathematic model based on your data is telling you that's the best shoe. You may put it on and say, well, you know what? I actually don't like that shoe or I don't like the color or I don't like how it fit me. I don't feel good about that shoe. So I'm simply not gonna wear it. So it's very important for us to, uh, once we've kind of narrowed down to, to a handful of solution to validate them in the real world. Uh, and the way we've done that was radical at the time we uh, took the output of a uh, mathematic model algorithm uh, model directly and 3D printed it. So what you see here is a 3D printed product that was printed overnight and that was tested uh, on Chilean uh, uh, Fraser Price uh, fit, you know. Why is that radical is as you may all uh, know studying industrial design, what we normally do is we open 
uh, mold. We go to most of the time uh, Asia manufacturing and we create what we call uh, a mold. So literally we're cutting aluminum, you know, not only it's very expensive, but it's, uh, it takes a lot of time. And by the time we get those samples back, it's probably at least a few weeks or months that have gone by. And the design project may have already moved ahead. And by the time we get the sample, we already want to try something different. So this was radical because we were able to try hundreds of prototypes within a month as opposed to one. So, you know, where uh, I want to lead you is I think uh, what's happening uh, in, the, in, in design today is that as the tool are getting more, tool and method are getting more and more evolved, there is a lot of uh, the role of the designer that become more and more into the curation curator of those intelligent systems. So not to be afraid uh, by that, because again, remember uh, Gary Gasparov is that beautiful idea of working as a team with an intelligent machine, you know, working a, 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 as a co-creation act together to make the best uh, product possible. But what we really do most of the time after having architect the system is curating the system. We look at magnificent solution space and we say a little bit more of this, a little bit more of that, not too much of that. I don't like that. This is not working for me. Or I think it's ugly, you know, because there is some things that are generated by the machine that simply aren't a Nike design, that don't fit within, uh, you know, like the brand ethos that we've built as a company for the last uh, 40 years. So this is the product. Uh, and what I want to talk to you about uh, a little bit today is uh, an interesting journey. So we've said that in the past, we've been, been building a size 10 shoe, you know, and then scaling it up and down. So if you have a bigger fit, we're just going to take the size 10 and scale it in a 3D software. Well, it's pretty bad to do that because the reality is if you do that, the size the big size often end up being too soft because you're just scaling the product and the small size are too stiff. So what we found out through that study is uh, that if you take those four athletes, they all running uh, the track all the same distance, 100 meter, but they go from size five to size 12. So pretty big difference, you know? Um, so we ask ourselves, since we're using powerful algorithm, can we change the data set and can we rerun the algorithm to generate a new solution that will be specifically designed for the size? And that's where we landed. And I'm gonna ask you to do a quick exercise, which is, you know, when you look for differences in picture when you're a kid and you're like trying to figure out, oh, what's different from the left to the right. Do that real quick and quickly realize that those may look alike from far. You know, it's like a family of product, the brother, the sister, the mother, the dad. But you can see that each model has a very unique arrangement of cells. It doesn't even have the same number of cells. And that is because for each model, uh, we've run it with a different set of constraints on data. This may seem simple to you, but it was groundbreaking in the sense that we never had a product in store that if you buy a size 5 and you buy a size 12, at the same time, they are different design. Now, there is also another thing that is interesting with running on mainly track and field is uh, they run around the track. So 100 meter is just straight line. As you start to run 1500 meter, you run and start to take the curve. And there is very different needs uh, from the athlete as you start to run the curve because you have to like steer with one foot, push, you start to bank, you are accelerating in the turn. So very different like uh, forces that are uh, getting uh, applied to the, to the product. So again, we say, you know what, like let's take a crack at it and uh, see if we could understand that uh, problem and solve for it. And that's where we landed. And uh, this is quite beautiful, you know, you start on the left and you have 100 meter sprint spike. And as you start to take the curve, you can see that those cells are opening to a lot for more flexibility. And they're not only opening, but they're opening from left to right to allow the medial to lateral to flex, uh, to take the curve. And then the more you go uh, to the distance uh, towards the 10,000 meter, the little stiffness is required, but you still want traction uh, on, on, on protect uh, the feet where you need. 
And then this happened, you know, in 2016, uh, we had a really successful uh, Olympic in those products across uh, track. And uh, we were really proud to have more than 45 medals uh, that were won in that, that family of products. And I uh, want you to take away that world is that world is that today what we're doing with computational design is we're building family of products with mutation that create a different product within that family, but that are generated from that same DNA, if you want. You know, it's the DNA of the product that mutate and create different child. Here is American football. So we use the same algorithm to generate American football plates and then baseball. So what we've really come up to this day and uh, that has been accelerated in the last uh, few years is creating as a team, you know, uh, sitting next to the computer and embracing artificial intelligence, embracing machine learning, not as uh, something that we fear or something that we look at as, oh, you're going to take my job and I'm going to become irrelevant, but rather something that can empower us as creative, that can augment us and that can excite us, that can unleash or creativity, inspire us, you know. Um, so what we're really talking about is augmented creativity. And I really love that quote from uh, Lee Sedol, you know. So Lee Sedol is uh, the player that play Go against uh, Google uh, AI. And uh, that's kind of uh, deja vu in the sense that it's pretty much uh, the same as Gary Gasparov. But as you may know, uh, the game of Go is even like a magnitude of complexity compared to chess because of the uh, uh, amount of combination of the, 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 the complexity. So Lee Sedol, after uh, losing um, with AlphaGo, say AlphaGo showed us that moves humans may have thought are creative were actually conventional. I think this will bring a new paradigm to Go. So, you know, it's, it's so interesting because it's the history that repeat is we can learn from machine and machine can learn from us, but it's not about trying to outbeat each other. It's about working together. On, uh, you know, I, I always make fun of at work and I say, you know, CAD need to be probably, you could redefine that computer augmented design and it is used uh, to unlock imagination of the designer and spark curiosity and surprise, you know. So uh, on that note, uh, that's kind of what I have for today. I want to leave a little bit of time. I know we have another session, but I want to leave a little bit of time if there is any question on that. Uh, I always uh, rush through things, so I know it may be a lot to, to, to digest, but uh, hopefully that, that may give you a, a good sneak peek at some of the activity of my team. Um, it was a very nice presentation, Mr. Rehsan. Um, so now I would like to hand over to the audience. If they have any questions, please switch on your camera. It will be very interactive and ask questions. I'm sure there will be many questions. Uh, hi, Lysander. This is Swarali. I hope I pronounced your name right. Yeah, it's perfect. Uh, I hope you're doing well. This was really inspiring. Um, I am currently an industrial design student and this really serves as a great example for somebody who is right now studying and you know is soon going to be in the industry. Um, so I had a question with regards to, um, so I had two questions that came, came across while you were presenting. Uh, the first question was that when you design for future, right? A lot of your, um, uh, a lot of uh, the stuff that you showed across, it, it, it was for designing for future. And when it comes to designing for future, how do you conduct a research per se? And when you conduct a research, what do you, um, what do you have in mind or what do you focus on when you actually take interviews or when you actually try to test out something? And um, my second question uh, was with regards to uh, what do you think or uh, how do you think design is moving ahead in terms of, like you said, right? Um, we're moving into um, how, how people are getting customized for their own needs and uh, uh, we're designing for mass production so do you think design is soon going to be more customized and you know you will have to kind of design shoes per se it's already going there that you know we are kind of customizing for individual people but like you gave the example of where you know you had different soles for the different size 
sized shoes for different pressure points, um, which was very inspiring. Uh, but so do you think that that's how it's going to keep moving ahead where, you know, every individual when you're designing for a mass, um, for a mass population, are you going to start designing individually? And how do you think that would, you know, move ahead? Uh, so, yeah. 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 So, you know, on your first question about how do you design for the future? I think you almost have to project yourself and kind of do a little bit of uh, what a lot of team like at Google or other big company have talked about, about prospective design you know, kind of almost say, what if uh, this is the stage of the world or this is the stage of the product by 2030? And from there, kind of almost like be a little bit of a provocator and say, I know that sounds crazy, but uh, let's embrace that and let's see how we can try to make the impossible possible, you know? And what I often uh, see in, in highly innovative team is their capacity to constantly be aware of, uh, what are the future technology or future trend or on kind of almost a little bit like a sci-fi writer, you know, someone that writes science fiction yeah. uh, by projecting themselves in that future, then they somehow start to put in place some next actionable steps that go towards a little bit like if you think of Elon Musk, you know, he wants to go to Mars, but that's not what he's trying to do first. He's first trying to make the, the kind of like rocket uh, go to space. Once the rocket go to space, he tried to land it back to Earth. And he knows that his goal is to live on Mars. But he knows that this sounds crazy as of today. But because he believes that that future can exist, he knows what are the things that need to happen to get there, if that makes sense. So I think then um, on the creative side, innovator, they are really capable of uh, connecting dots, seeing like uh, a new method of manufacturing that is emerging on being like, okay, as of today, this is not viable for a mass produce good. But I believe that in five years from now, that technology will be mainstream. So I'm gonna take a leap of faith on design, almost like ignoring that that technology is crazy today. And you see that over and over, you know, if you look at augmented reality, and you look at augmented reality 10 years ago, people were like, no, that's Star Wars. That's Yoda talking to his uh, Jedi, you know? Like you're crazy. Well, some people, you know, made it happen and knew that uh, the technology will become real at some point. So you see that a lot in innovation team. On the second question, uh, you brought a good point, which is that it's still, uh, I think the world has moved to customization a lot, mainly because uh, of the digital world. You know, like I'm from the generation where we didn't add apps and we didn't add all those intelligent systems that were capable of becoming bespoke and tailored to us. Today, it's a completely different landscape. As you all know, your data is being used all the time by a big company to push to you a bespoke experience on your phone, you know, a bespoke experience on your computer that is highly customized to you to the point that uh, there is often people that even say that company like Google know more about you than your own family. You know, or uh, even yourself, because they have models that are built so precisely. Um, in product design and uh, industrial design, it's a little bit more challenging, mainly because of manufacturing. And the revolution in manufacturing hasn't quite yet happened. You start yeah. to see it uh, in some fields like automotive, where, for example, BMW is using 3D printing to make yeah. little parts that will be much more expensive to manufacture with conventional method but yeah. they are 3D printing it. And you don't know about it, but if you know where to look for, you will see that it's 3D printed. So we're starting to see it slowly and slowly becoming more mm -hmm. viable at scale. But it's true that uh, sadly, if you think about scale that is million, like we do at Nike, it is not viable to 3D print for million of people uh, with one single solution. We want to move towards there, but that comes with a very unique set of challenge, which is manufacturing. But I truly believe that uh, you, in your life uh, span and in your professional career, you will see that change happening. You know, uh, you will see manufacturing becoming much more agile uh, and capable of um, creating, at least if not fully bespoke, some what we call semi bespoke or yeah. semi custom. You know. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that was really, uh, that answered my question. And I look forward to staying in touch with you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. 
So I have a question. Uh, how to create a demand of a certain new innovation uh, which might might not be on the top priority of consumers? Sorry, can you say again? Um, how to create demand of a certain new innovation which not which might not be on the top priority of consumers? So you, you want to know how uh, we actually don't create the demand. We try to like do we try to understand what are the needs from the consumer. <coughs> Sorry, on how we can improve the product. So then you know it's like almost like the demand is natural because it's a better product in a sense. If I if I understand correctly the question. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, sir. So I am Asan Kulkarni. I am a member of um, students committee. I have a question. So the question goes like this: How to spot relevant problems to solve if the end user is practically very distinct from the designer? So if the solution that you need to create is very different or very specialized compared to the model you built. Okay. Yeah. So you probably will need to evolve your model or change or make it much more rich, adding parameter to it in order to start to solve for that, that specific uh, niche solution uh, that you're describing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Fine. Yeah, I got it, sir. Thank you so much. Do we have any more questions for the speaker? Uh, yes, I have a question. Hello, sir. Hi. I'm Atharva here. Uh, I had this question: uh, How to get started with computational design and collaborating with it industrial design? How do you exactly start with it? What would you suggest? Oh, so I think what, what, what can be good is to first kind of understand the method before the tool, because it does require a shift in mindset, uh, almost accepting as a designer that you are no longer in control of exactly all the pixel of the design, I must to say, you know, but rather that you're creating a model that can describe uh, design. So I think, uh, you know, reading online about computational design, generative design on how it's been used in art on, uh, in the industry is interesting. And then, then in terms of tool, this day there is uh, many tools. I will always recommend, uh, you know, Rhino on Grasshopper for all of you because it's probably something that you may already been looking at for traditional uh, direct modeling. So that's one of the package that is pretty accessible this day. You can find a lot of uh, content. But really, like um, those ideas of like computational or generative or parametric algorithmic design, you found them in any software these days. You know, Houdini uh, has a lot of, of that same kind of visual scripting interface that allowed you to, to work within a generative system. Uh, Blender, a, a similar uh, model these days. Uh, Fusion 360. Uh, as also an environment called generative design, although it's a little bit different, it's more topology optimization uh, rather than what I was describing. So uh, processing, if you like coding, uh, actual like uh, coding, uh, text coding, processing environment is very interesting. It's used by a lot of artists and designers to create like a beautiful piece of uh, art on interaction. Um, there's really a lot, lot of package these days uh, that are accessible, but understanding the design method on uh, methodology first before the tool is important, I think. Okay, sir, understood. Thank you. Maybe I'll take one more question and then we can move, we, if you yeah. want to move to the next question. If someone wants to ask a question, please go ahead. Well, if no more question. Uh, thank you all for having me. Uh, it was really, really, uh, I was really happy when I got the email again because I, I love the approach of your school. So I'm looking forward to see uh, all of you uh, evolve through your design uh, study. So don't hesitate to hit me up on LinkedIn. I have a BNs, I have a personal website, a uh, bunch of, of things where you can, we can keep connected and I can see how you 
evolve as a, a creative in that exciting uh, world we're living in. Um, so I'm assuming uh, man, no more questions from audience, but they'll be sure to find you on LinkedIn. Um, so I think so. Uh, I should uh, give the outro. So as we near the end of the session, I would like to thank our guest, Mr. Polin, for sparing his valuable time and sharing his knowledge with us and his experience at Nike. Thank you so much. It was very inspiring. Yes. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.